So did you hear that last conversation there about journalism? Do you have anything to add to that? Did any, anything come to mind? As a matter of fact, Richard, I know that you, the, the content that you make at Demand Media is now starting to be picked up by newspapers and print. Is that not true? It is. We've been published in Atlanta Journal-Constitution and a couple other papers. They're coming out right now. So maybe what I can do before we get deeper into this is, is ask each of you, uh, not that you need an introduction, any of you, but to, to sort of give us a couple of minutes on, on, on who you are, what you're doing now, what you've done. Um, Start with you, Richard. Hi, I'm Richard Rosenblatt. I'm the uh, chairman and CEO of Demand Media. We are a company, John, as you know, that has a social media platform that uh, helps add social media to our own properties as well as properties across the web. And we have what we call Demand Studios, which allows for the efficient creation of content at scale, but with a high focus on quality. Uh, I've been involved in social media since 1994 with iMall through MySpace and now with Demand Media. Yeah. I try to convince the world to buy plastic guitars. <laughs> You've done a little bit more before that, though, particularly in the content and media business. Yeah, no, I spent, um, well, some of my former partners and bosses, Eric Hippo, I worked for Eric for 15 years at Zip Davis and was in magazine publishing. And uh, when the internet came along, we were the first traditional media company to actually think about and spin out an internet division, which was called ZDNet, which ultimately uh, I merged with CNET and um, then left there and worked uh, with his best friend, Mr. Terry Semmel, at Yahoo for five years as the chief operating officer, then retired from that and uh, spent a little bit of time thinking about what to do and ultimately now uh, joined Activision to run Guitar Hero. So for those of you who don't know much about Guitar Hero, it's sort of fascinating. Been there a few months. But it's um, in five years, it sold over 40 million units around the world. It's the sixth largest gaming franchise ever in history. In the last two years, uh, it's been the number one selling game franchise of any kind. And uh, this year, we had the fun with Guitar Hero 5 of going up against Rock Band Beatles. And the numbers came out, and we looked pretty awesome. And we've got two big launches, um, Band Hero and DJ Hero, which I'm happy to talk about later. Yeah, great. Peter. Um, I've been in the entertainment business for 40 years, uh, ran some of the big companies like Polygram and Columbia Pictures and Sony, and uh, currently have my own company, Manly Entertainment, which is really focused as a boutique. Uh, after running other people's businesses, even though he had the title, um, the idea was at this stage of my life, my third act of my life, I wanted to be able to play in the fields of the Lords, the Lords being all the different entertainment venues. So I have an active movie company, uh, make finance my movies, make them, distribute them in the world, often through large domestic distributors. Still do that. A lot of films that you've heard of, um, uh, Rain Man, Color Purple, Flashdance, Batman, The Score, Enemy at the Gates, and more recently Into the Blue and uh, The Jacket, and a bunch of motion pictures that I actually produce. A lot of television shows. Did the Brotherhood series and lots of movies uh, for the different cable networks. So very conventional content uh, across the, the conventional platforms. But I also um, became very interested in sports entertainment, and again, another audience element, and a large, one of the largest uh, providers of professional baseball teams and stadiums across the country, uh, affiliated with the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Chicago White Sox, uh, the Giants, the minor league teams, AAA, AA, and single A teams, and a lot of uh, entertainment oriented with that. And then also, um, through Mandalay Media, a small public company, uh, became very interested a number of years ago in mobile, in gaming and uh, have advanced the, um, my business in that space, uh, providing content uh, in that space quite successfully. And so I enjoy the, my real passion, my real, real passion, as Richard will tell you, is, is teaching. I've, I'm a full professor at UCLA and I've taught in the business and film school, digital media school there for about 39 years. And I've seen the, ch the tsunami of change of students that have come through that institution and offer the business, our businesses, uh, the future. So we've got a lot of different experiences here, but I want to ask each of you the same basic question, um, which is how has, let me back up, the content business has as one of its really important core, you know, legs of the stool is distribution. How has the distribution business changed in, in, in the last few years for each of your core businesses, and many of you are in many businesses, um, and, and, and what's to come? I'll, I'll let 
Richard, you, you, you're great. Thanks, John. You know, um, if you start with content, which is what we're very focused on, the way we look at it is there's three ways in which you can find content. And this is what I think has changed, right? People can directly navigate to it. They could type in a URL and go directly to the content they want. They could find it through search, and search is continuing to get smarter and smarter. And on that point, what's really changed is the tail, right? I mean, the tail has gotten longer and longer and longer. And as Google and Bing continue to get better and better, and we saw some demos today, of being able to find very specific stuff. And if it can actually read your mind and know what you're looking for, then you need to think about content and its micro mm -hmm. units. And how do you create content so it fills the tail? And obviously, as you know, what we're focused on is more of the commercial tail. Right? The tail can either be for-profit or non-profit. Uh, the third way is social media. And this is what's really changed, what we're really excited about, is how do you start to work with Twitters and Facebooks and MySpaces and all the other um, social media sites to add content to those users. So it goes from being just friends sending content back and forth to actually really useful, professional, high quality content. And I think if you look at distribution in those three ways, then you have to build content differently based on each of those ways. And I want to get into that. But I, I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in Guitar Hero. I know in your experience at Yahoo and, and at CNET before that, then coming to a franchise that um, where the distribution, I imagine, for the most part is retail, retail and boxes that are in shrink wrap. Uh, is that going to change? It is changing. And the best thing I could do is give you sort of this st statistics, which is there's something like 80 million consoles. And three years ago, the number of people on Guitar Hero who played connected, your console connected to the internet, was close to zero. So the numbers this year, the percentage of people who are playing any version of Guitar Hero game online has grown 100% year over year, just to put it in perspective. Mm. So I think last week alone, something like 2 million people were playing the game while connected to the internet. So the numbers are just getting huge. So the only obstacle, you know, our view, my view of this whole thing, John, has been for years, just bet on the inevitable. So anytime you put something between what people want, they want to get it out of the way. So when you, when you were playing a game and that game was sort of, you had to wait once a year, it's the same thing as shrink wrap software. You wait once a year, you sit around, you go to retail, um, the game doesn't change when you play it, the value proposition is high at first and then drops significantly. But when you look now and you say, okay, I can buy the game, then I can connect the game, and then the amount of content I can get in the game, and now with things like Guitar Hero, which you can actually write music and contribute it into the game, not just for you, but for anybody that wants to play it, when you look at, at even just Guitar Hero 5, when I look at the connected users, what songs they're playing, and we check that pretty much every minute of every day, the largest overall category is something called uh, Jam, which is all the music created by other Guitar Hero users. <laughs> so it isn't one of those songs that outdoes the Rolling Stones, but cumulatively, people are playing more of that music than the other music. And so uh, the internet is, it's, the whole thing is inevitable. Content is coming directly to you, whatever device you happen to use. Every device is going to be connected. Every device is going to be always on. It's always going to be with you. It's always going to be fast. It may not be that way today, but we have to bet on that for the future. So when you look at the 2010 slate of the kinds of things you'll see in what was a traditional video game just three years ago, everything will be about connectivity. So the experience itself, how frequently the game updates, um, the experiences you can have. Uh, I'll give you one other statistic that just blew me away. So since the release of, I think, September 2nd of Guitar Hero 5, something like 25 million songs have been played while connected to the internet, which at the time I did the calculation was something like a song every seven seconds. So it's give the people what they want and they'll do it. And so it's, it's for, for us as a business, it opens up whole new opportunities. So instead of getting you know, traditional retail business, which you sell it, shrink wrap, you go through retail, we will continue to do all of that. But you start to look at it now as the number of users, ARPU, yield per user, the kinds of ways that users, the same way a lot of the internet sites have been built, which is how can the user not only participate in the game, but contribute to the game? And what are the ways they can contribute to the game? And a lot of it is borrowing from what you see of the really hot um, uh, social gaming companies like Zynga and others that are doing incredibly well. So we will participate in all of that and are beginning to do so pretty significantly um, as early as this year. Great. Peter, your business has been, I think, very impacted in the last, I mean, I, would, I don't want to have, you know, I know you well enough to know that you, you aren't personally responsible for all the, you know, for Hollywood's off-again, on-again war 
with its own <laughs> consumers um, around the internet. But but obviously that's been a very big story. Uh, and how has you know the economics of of producing a film, for example, changed because of the windowing compression that's occurred and, and the distribution shifts in your business? Well, the two descriptions you just had are the forces upon the movie business because the bandwidth of the audience is convulsed by the incoming resources that these folks make. I mean, just, it just is. And so it has to be influenced. The audience that the movie going audience and television audience is young and it's influenced by these forces. Uh, many of the folks at these large studios and networks are not equally influenced by them. And the content manufacturers, especially on movies, uh, is traditional content. I mean, it really is traditional content. And it's not brand oriented. No, only a knucklehead would say, let's go down to the AMC theater, heard of Warner Brothers Pictures playing there. You just, you know, you'd arrest them. So the idea is each movie is a new business and it competes against all other businesses for awareness and perception in the bandwidth of an audience. And what's happened today, which may not seem staggering to the audience here in terms of numbers, but it certainly is to me in my lifetime, the average MPA uh, movie today is $76 million. And the cost of advertising just to bring it to market in a world, global market is about $140, $130 million. That's the average movie, 100, that's a $125, $130 million investment. So you're talking about uh, a world and and that investment is played out on Friday at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the first day of release. They model the entire picture. So if you're Rupert Murdoch, talk about the kind of tsunami of forces at work in my business, if you're Rupert Murdoch and you've financed, catch a hold of this one, Avatar, James Cameron, he's the Titanic. If, you're, if you financed Avatar at 300, they argued, say it was 320, 340, or 350, at 350 million dollars, a third of a billion dollars for a movie, and you're going to put out $150 million in prints and ads globally to release that's half a billion dollars for a movie. That Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, you got sphincter arrest. You're thinking about what's, happen what's happened there, right? And then you're, you're, the, you're the schmuck sitting at the meeting on Monday when somebody starts reporting the numbers. And there's another picture out called Paranormal, which costs $15,000. $15,000. $15, and you look at the number and that picture is playing for the same $10.50 at the movie theater in the same two hours, and there's your problem. That would suck. <laughs> <laughs> Why then does anyone make an avatar? Well, I think if you did Titanic, you know, you're seduced by that, you did Titanic and you're Fox and you made a billion dollars in the movie, maybe more, and the same filmmaker comes along, you know, you're, you could get seduced by it. And you know, this film's gonna be great. And, it, and, and the, all the audiences will go to see it. It's just, that's the nature of this business. I mean, Ferraris sell this for the same price as Volkswagens. Uh, I'm curious about one of the, I think one of the underlying uh, uh, tensions that we really didn't get to in the last discussion about journalism was to get the creators of journalism paid I think that if you unpack some of the angst in that dialogue, you know, as a journalist myself, is how does the paycheck keep coming to do what I do? Um, I'm curious, uh, all of your uh, thoughts on this question of, of getting the content creator paid. Um, it must be interesting in Guitar Hero because you're talking about using songs that have already been created, and those people may or may not have already been pretty well paid for that, but they're gonna get paid more. Mm -hmm. um, in your case, you've got a model that, where you're paying people who may never have been paid before for created content, is that correct? Um, we do have a model where, yes, there are some people that are um, writing content that probably this is their first time, but that's really a small part of our business. Um, the majority of our business is demand studios, where these are qualified content creators that are being paid based on what they write or what videos they make, and they're all professional freelancers. So you know, some of the stats people aren't aware of is these content creators we're talking about, 50% um, of them that are part of our studio have published for a magazine or newspaper. 25% of them have written and published a book, and the remaining 25% are either a professional technical writer with a PhD or some type of advanced degree. So you, you're talking about a real professional workforce. That, I mean, I, I just read that the New York Times laid off another 100 people. Yeah. I mean, the amount of layoffs that are going on 
there, there is a dearth of incredible professional talent that is written for traditional media that needs another place to write. And you know, what we're finding is a lot of these people are writing for free already on blogs or other places, and they're not getting traffic, they're not getting paid, and they're not learning their trade. So what, what, what we try and do is merge those three main principles that by being part of Demand Studios, content creators can get paid, they can get fame by being published on you know, very popular, very traffic properties, and they can get educated. Mm -hmm. Because every single writer gets a scorecard and gets tips and is part of social media. Right. So, so I mean, we paid out $17 million so far in the last two years okay. to content creators, and we, you know, we're paying out millions of dollars. So there are people getting paid. It's yeah. just not the people making you know, $100 million for creating these massive movies, but it does add up. Dan, is there gonna be a ecosystem uh, or an economy uh, of Guitar Hero in the future where, where there might be people getting paid for uh, adding value to the ecosystem of Guitar Hero? I think it's inevitable. You know, we pay for every song that we put in the game. Um, and, you know, there's a huge amount of songs. We have great relationships with the majority of the record labels. and. But you know, you, you can just watch the same pattern happen over and over in every game. Every time you try to put a wall around somebody, people go around the wall. So the console creates a wall, and people want to go around the wall. So now you have your iPhone, and there's 47,000 apps, and a lot of them are games. And so we, you know, to be competitive, we have to have the best possible experience. We have to be able to create the greatest value for the consumer. We have to be a profitable business. And we have to find ways to create, you know, to use some of the same things that the successful internet companies have used, which are network effects and viral and, <clears throat> and all of those things. And so you can imagine scenarios inside a video game, particularly a game like Guitar Hero, where people not only play the song, right, play the game and play against other people, but contribute to the game. And that content can range from everything from digital goods to music itself. And so, you know, the, the no tracking of the song itself can be increasingly automated with better tools and users themselves. I mean, if you've ever seen anybody really who's a great guitar hero player play the game, they, there's actually a tool in the game now. It's not even a good tool. It's a tool that lets people write music with the plastic guitar and no track it. And those things have, themselves have been downloaded over 25 million times, just those songs. So, again, betting on the inevitable, you can imagine a scenario where as long as that creates value for the player, for the other players in the game, for the entire experience, and um, then and we benefit from it as well, then it makes great sense to do. How has the creator, and, and, and in your case, you're the producer, but and, and as well as the directors, the, the, the sort of the, the folks directly responsible for creating film, how has their job changed over the past few years, and, and, and can you see it changing more? Uh, I think the influence of the components that were in into films in the 70s and 80s and even the 90s have changed. Uh, if you look at, just take a slice, look at the summer, in the summer theatrical or the summer television, you'll see that these big companies were on a search for certainty. They wanted certainty. So how did they get certainty? First they started with stars. They've got to have the stars in television and movies. Found out the audience didn't really care that much about the stars. Then they said they want certainty. So what did they do? They went to special effects instead of stars. And they went to that kind of noise. And then they went to franchise, tentpole, sequels, and remakes. Because they want certainty. And 17 of the 24 films last summer were franchise, tentpoles, and remakes. You know, Airplane 35, Rocky 71, you know, all these movies that, you know, to just to get the audience, you know, that they thought they could get. So what's happened is in the movie and television business, there hasn't been a renaissance of great creativity. There's great of creative people, and you have these disparate groups of people. You have a whole group of people, 40 and above, that are creators, writers, producers, directors, and you have executives that are 27, 29, 30. They want their own voice. They hire their own people. There's kind of a chasm that's built between them, and it's very interesting because I think these folks' business and my other, my other businesses have influenced that. I think the answer is going to be, ultimately, that these movie companies may well look like Broadway, Broadway companies. Few big pictures made a year, you know, kind of uh, out of home entertainment extravaganzas, because all the small films are disappearing. You go look, for a, go look for a small film. The only film that came out so far that's a small film that any audience has seen is this film Hurt Locker. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, I mean, it's a... Oh, it's, the Hurt Locker, yeah. You've heard of it. So, but look, it's amazing, but if you say Transformers, everybody raised their hand. But the idea is, 
films that are about something, it's hard to make them today. Do you think that's going to change? I mean, let me put it another way. I sure hope that changes. <laughs> um, it, it, it will change, but it'll change when there's another distribution model that aggregates the niches of audiences that exist all over the, all Isn't over the world. Isn't that what the internet is? I mean, yes, but it, what's but it's, the problem? Why, 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 how come we haven't gotten to that? We have gotten to it. It just hasn't been realized economically. You have to understand the theatrical motion picture lived and breathed by creating an awareness in the marketplace, in the feature marketplace. Then there were a set of windows all the way down. There was hotel vision and pay-per-view and cable and uh, video and syndication. They're all collapsing. So where, where you would get a return on investment? So people are looking for these big extravaganzas, these small films. You know, if you try to release them communally in a theatrical exhibition setting, the exhibitors don't want them. Look what happened. We, we, built, we built the Lowe's multiplexes. We built them in Manhattan, in, in San Francisco, uh, in Chicago. We built all these multiplexes. The concept was, like the internet, we're going to do a 20-screen complex. Everything's playing there. Everything's playing there. So what happened? Studios and Greed and Avarice hijacked it and turned the multiplex into a simplex. They played Transformers at 7, 705, 710, 715, <laughs> 720, 725, and one more film at 715, 720. So the and idea is to the squeeze record, it out. We make the game for Transformers if anybody wants to buy it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me ask a, a question uh, about the role of marketing. Um, we, we had a pretty robust conversation about that last session. Um, there's marketing, you know, demand has marketing in, right. in many of your products. Uh, it's hard to miss the bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken on the ping pong table in Guitar Hero. <laughs> um, uh, product placement has, has sort of become a standard and now stars are attached not just with their name but what the wrist watch is that they will wear in the film. Um, how has marketing changed in, in each of your content platforms and, and what might we expect going forward? And by the way, we have time for questions. Please come to the mics. We'll take questions right after this. Uh, do you want to start? So, from our standpoint, most of our marketing, we actually look at, it's a little different than what you said, but I'll answer the question also, is most of our revenue right now is derived from you know, small ads by Google and Yahoo and others, as well as uh, branded advertising in a small part. But we look at content as marketing, right? We think the future is producing a quality piece of the right content and getting it in those three different areas I talked about, whether people mm -hmm. are looking for it on Facebook or MySpace, whether or not they're searching for it, or if they're directly navigating to it. So we've been saying that when we started the company that we believe content is marketing and marketing is your content. And uh, if you think of it that way, it's much more lasting than buying keywords. So instead of just having someone buy two keywords, go there and never come back again, instead we like to believe that if you put a valuable, quality, engaging piece of content with social media, you'll be able to build an audience around it. The payback's much quicker, you build an audience, it doesn't feel like marketing. It feels like you're providing real quality information. So I think that's changing. I think people are starting words, to realize. You're saying publishers are going to be, marketers are publishers, so to speak, or content creators. They should be. I, I, uh, right. I, I certainly agree with that. I mean, that's what, I mean, they should spend their time instead of thinking about designing a little ad, about thinking about designing very valuable content that the user wants and trying to figure that out, right? The science of that. Isn't that actually what marketing has been in television, for example? You were given a window, it was a 30 second window, and you had to create really valuable content in that window if you, if you were going to get the narrative of your brand between the ears of a of right. a potential consumer. Right, and you know the big difference is that that ad goes away. Right, that ad's for 30 seconds, it can only engage so much, and then you hope to do a, another action. Right, this is content that the user can actually engage with multiple times, and if they're social media, get involved with and invite their friends. Mm -hmm. So it really has, there's real value in providing a quality piece of content that, you know, could last for decades if it's the right type of content. Dan, how is it going to change on the platform of Guitar Hero? For marketers to use Guitar Hero or how we market? Well, you can answer both, but I'm initially interested in whether that bucket of KFC is going to do something different in the future, particularly as you think about the online component of it, right? I, you know, I have to be honest. I don't think in-game advertising is a huge market opportunity. I think there is, when there is relevancy and proximity to why you would you right. know, get it in the game, but we're not going to ruin the game experience by putting in things that are irrelevant. And so if it's Coca-Cola or KFC, those are, you know, Coca-Cola in particular, the different brands line up to music and all of those things, and they can actually be value additive in the game. But I don't, I don't see it as a big growth trend 
for gaming. And I, I, I never thought it was, even when I was at Yahoo, and I'm not sure why people think it is today, because in the game, you're actually experiencing the game. So when it makes sense that you can do it. From, from my perspective, what, what has changed, and it's obvious to everybody sort of in Silicon Valley, is you know, Guitar Hero itself, we launched Guitar Hero 5 and took 40% of our television budget and put it on the internet, which I think we were one of the first major brands to actually put our money where our mouth is. And you know, we used uh, the sites, obviously, many of the companies that I worked for or worked at. So um, Yahoo was, was a big participant in that. MySpace was coming on later with Owen. And, and Facebook, in particular, <clears throat> did a phenomenal job. But if you, you know, what we decided to do was let's go. We already have a huge installed base. We're going to be able to reach them more directly than we've ever been before. Video games could never do that historically. But now that they're connected to the internet, but even if they're not connected to the internet, there are a million fans on Facebook of Guitar Hero. So something that we as Activision never really touched before. When I got there, it was 500,000. Now it's over a million. And working with the Facebook team to do a combination of utilizing their tools and also buying advertising <coughs> on there, which amplifies itself. So for every dollar you spend to get a friend, that friend adds more friends. It's just been, so I, I, you know, I sort of see the future of a direct relationship. Even when you're talking about films, the, the challenge has been exactly what he said. It's not that people won't watch them. People can find more of what they want. They can find it more in the environments that they're in. It's the economics have not yet caught up to it. Right. So a lot of these industries were built with all these people taking bits and pieces and adding up all these prices. And the consumer didn't really see much value right. coming from that. And they're not willing to pay for that. But consumers are always willing to pay for If you look at the casual games, people are spending a fortune to buy poker chips. That's content to them. So I think the definition has gotten a lot broader. I think mm -hmm. access to content has gotten a lot better. I think the better you have a direct relationship with consumers, the better your business is going to be, and the faster we do it, the, the better our business is going to become. And we can utilize whatever money we had for other environments more intelligently where people actually want to spend their time. I'll give you one last stat, which is if you look at the demographics of 30 and below, when you look at the internet and you look at gaming, those are the two largest categories of where people spend their time in entertainment. Now that those two things are coming together, they're going to represent 40 to 50% of everybody's time under 30. That's ridiculous. And, and the sooner we take advantage of that, the better. So, Peter, I'll give you the last word because we have to wrap up, I'm afraid. Well, you know, the idea, first of all, of two, there were two sides to that question. The question of how market brands take advantage of this vehicle called movies and television. And anybody that thinks that Tom Cruise, and I made movies with all these people, putting a Coke bottle on a table when Tom Cruise is talking to Cameron Diaz, that Coke bottle means anything to a potential buyer is insane. They, the reticular activating system eliminates it from the value. It's only when the content of that advertising moment is integrated into the narrative of the story that it becomes resonant, memorable, and actionable. If you think about Mini Cooper in the, in the, the Italian job, or you think about some of these films that actually the, the product of the brand played a role in the narrative. It was one of the step processes in the narrative that it becomes integrated and can be very valuable, both in promoting the film and in promoting the product. So that's one side of the question. The other side that I thought you were asking, it's interesting, is that um, the whole co conventional entertainment business was built, built around awareness and perception and a, a length of time to create that, believe it or not, after the marketplace had received the product. What's happened now is word of mouth, that's where word of mouth came. Word of mouth comes now actually at the moment of release or before. I mean, the glow you see in the theaters is the handhelds texting in the first night their entire social media network of what it is. It's, it, there's no chance that first night is so crucial. So you have to work to load the system really early, spend all that advance money. And what's happened is you get two pushes. You got a $100 million film, and you really know that the internet's going to really talk to your audience, and that's the place to get them, whether it's through your mechanism or your mechanism or some other mechanism. But when it comes around two weeks before, and you're tracking the film, people that have grown up in a conventional media go, oh, I need that full page ad in the paper. Oh, I need to spend the money. That's crazy. I know we're going to see the audience, but I, the question I have is, and I always wonder this at Yahoo, which is, if, if a site like Yahoo or sites like Facebook or MySpace, if Yahoo reaches literally, you know, half a billion people, yeah. what would you need to spend three or four million dollars to create an ad for, to then run it in mediums that people aren't watching anymore? So they're spending more and more and more to reach fewer and fewer people. 
And I've just never understood it. Definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So, you know, it's like that's exactly the truth of it. Got it. But, you know something? It's like the rat in the maze. They keep looking for a place where there's no cheese, but they'll die looking for it. <laughs> well, please join me in thanking these three gentlemen for a great conversation. Thank you, Richard. That's awesome. Dan, Peter, thank you very much.